Well, I want to welcome the members back to the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we are reconvening at the recess just to get an update of where we are for members and for those in the public who are just chiming in for the first time that we have gone through House File 38, um, House File 1030, and we are currently on House, 5, uh, House File 1078. All of these three bills will be combined into the public safety and judiciary omnibus bill with House File 1068 being the vehicle bill. And so with that, we are currently on amendments. We have our, our Chair Mariani, who has walked through the, the bill, the current bill as it is. We've had our fiscal staff, Mr. Waltz, who have walked through the spreadsheet. And now we're going to move on to the amendment. So, um, Chair Mariani, would you like to move and explain your A44 amendment? Yes, but, uh, Madam Chair, I, I would. Before I do, just very, very quickly, I do want to encourage uh, members to uh, read the letters that have been sent on 1078 uh, that uh, the chair has posted. Um, there was one from the Alzheimer's Association, another from the Minnesota Firefighters Association. Uh, Department of Corrections, um, I just want to very quickly mention the Department of Public Safety. One of the things uh, that we did not do, uh, and it's not unusual, is uh, that we didn't adopt all the provisions that the governor uh, came forward. Uh, the Department of Public Safety, uh, you know, wants to highlight uh, two provisions that uh, we didn't fund. Uh, one was a juvenile justice uh, unit request, uh, and the other is for the build out of the uh, uh, fusion center um, and um, you know we're going to continue to help have that conversation uh, with the department but I, I just really out of respect the executive branch wanted to lift that up and highlight that uh, uh, for the members um, and uh, you know uh, assure folks that we're going to continue to have that conversation with, uh, with the department of public safety uh, madam chair yes I would move the a44 amendment Yes, could you explain it to us, please? Mm, yes, um, the A44 uh, amendment has several uh, pieces in it. Um, uh, there are a few uh, technical fixes that were caught by House Council. Um, you know, when you put a big bill like this, there's always going to be something you know that isn't quite right. Um, and so, there's some fixes to that uh, advised by Council. Um, there is um, a technical fix regarding a two hundred thousand dollar appropriation uh, for the criminal alert uh, network uh, updates uh, that's affiliated with uh, Representative Ewa King's uh, House File 28 that deals with dementia uh, and Alzheimer's. And basically, you know, we, we move it um, um, out of one division and into the appropriate division, which is the BCA account. There is a, um, a major uh, a part of that amendment is uh, additional uh, funding, uh, four million a year for um, to uh, place that the Office of Justice uh, Programs and DPS to implement the Hometown Heroes Assistance Program. Um, this uh, uh, assistance program provides financial assistance to firefighters um, who, as I mentioned earlier, are disproportionately di diagnosed uh, higher than the general population for cancer, uh, heart our disease, uh, suicide, and other trauma-related um, 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 uh, illnesses. Um, so we're adding that uh, into the bill. We did hear uh, that provision um, uh, during the course of the, the, the session, and we've heard it before in prior years. There's also, uh, it reduces the appropriation uh, to, a brand, uh, to a brand new grant program that we created um, in uh, public safety for um, um, uh, policing uh, um, uh, updates of their uh, police uh, uh, policies uh, and, and manuals, um, along with some training uh, uh, components up to that. Uh, we're still funding that, we're still keeping that program in, but we're lowering it down from a million a year uh, to $500,000 a year. Um, we are, um, uh, as part of that relationship, or, or related to that rather, uh, is that we're reducing the total amount of funds transferred from uh, MinCor uh, by a million dollars. And that has to do with, uh, you know, the ongoing use of those, uh, um, uh, drawdown of those MinCor uh, dollars. 
Um, there's a uh, relocation of a salary increase for the Department of Corrections uh, fugitive uh, specialists, uh, moving it from the community service subdivision to the corrections institutional uh, subdivision. Um, and um, let's see very quickly, uh, there, oh, there's a change to uh, survivor uh, support grant uh, language uh, to make it clear that the Office of Justice Programs will not be administering uh, grants directly to individuals. That's not what we do. Um, um, uh, you know, we, uh, the language uh, corrects that so that we're administering grants to organizations uh, that serve uh, individual uh, victims of crime. Um, and Madam Chair, that, that's really um, that's really the amendment, and would appreciate your support. Thank you, Chair Mariani. Uh, members, are there any questions on the amendment? Seeing none, Chair Mariani renews his motion to adopt the A44 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion prevails, and the amendment is adopted. Chair Marcourt, would you like to move and explain your A46 amendment? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to move the A46 amendment. And members, uh, back in August, uh, on a bipartisan basis, we uh, passed changes to the use of deadly force, which is statute 609.066. And I think that was passed back in August and um, to take effect March 1st of 2021. Well, in the first or second week of February, I started getting contacted uh, by local law enforcement that they just had kind of found out about some of the language and they had some concerns and that it just wasn't gonna be enough time to really train officers uh, properly uh, and to kind of get the information out on this. And what I found out later is that uh, what kind of caused this delay is that the Department of Public Safety had asked for some assistance in legal guidance from the Attorney General's office as far as kind of the changes from the old law to the new law, uh, how it might affect um, training practices and operations and so forth. So at, at any rate, what happened is it wasn't until about mid-February um, two weeks ahead of the new law coming into effect where I think our local sheriff's office and, and police departments and so forth really started after the AG's office came out, started to look at how this would impact training and all sorts of things. And so what this does is it extends um, from March 1st to September 1st, uh, the effective uh, date for this part of the statute, 609.066, dealing with use of deadly force. Uh, it's a top priority for our law enforcement uh, organizations uh, from the local or law enforcement that I've talked to. And compounding this now is that our border states, uh, because they haven't really had time to see what the ramifications are have said uh, that they don't want to do mutual aid agreements um, with Minnesota. And so in my area in particular, right on the North Dakota border, I've talked to my local police chief and local sheriff, and uh, they have, in North Dakota, they've instructed their law enforcement to opt out uh, until they can learn more about uh, just the ramifications of the changes. And so, in my area, the Red River uh, Valley SWAT team, which involves North Dakota and Minnesota officers, and the Metro Street Crimes Unit, and other kind of mutual aid agreements have been stopped. So that certainly is compromising public safety uh, in the area. And so uh, this is what folks, law enforcement is asking for. It would allow a brief pause, and more important, it would allow for uh, the interpretation of the new language it would allow our law enforcement agencies to modify their policies and to develop and provide quality training to their officers and also being able to educate and allow these North Dakota, South Dakota, other border states uh, to, to really take a look 
uh, to see what's all in this so we can get everyone working back together. So members, I would ask for your support. <clears throat> members, do you have any questions? Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Moran, Representative Marquardt, I wanna thank you for uh, bringing this forward. This is a very important issue for law enforcement. Uh, as you mentioned, it was uh, took a long time for the Attorney General's office to give their guidance and talking to some of the people. It wasn't, uh, it was interesting reading their guidance that came out January 29th. Uh, the uh, working group putting this things together at post board met about two weeks later after, after they could digest that information, which gave it less than two weeks from the time the information came out to train over 10,000 officers in the states and it cannot be done. Uh, they're working on the curriculum. Some of the curriculum has now been approved and they're starting the uh, training process. But in talking with the chiefs and the sheriffs, it's gonna take six months to get all that training done. And so that puts it to September 1st. So thank you again for bringing this amendment forward. Members, are there any other questions to the amendment? I, I would just like to uh, just state that um, this language change that I carry the bill through um, the negotiations, and which is really important um, that we was able to come to some common language around the use of force. Because the previous language was really so subjective. And you know, as we walk through this and talk to those who were experts and professionals in this arena, the conclusion was that changing the language to the current lang language that is there will really will save lives on both sides. And so it is really critically important in my mind that officers are trained in this new concept of use of force and what that looks like. And so, you know, it is unfortunate that it took so long for the guidance to come out. Um, but we need, in, in my mind, you know, we have to give these law enforcement the time to have this very, very important training around the use of force. Um, so glad to, um, was able to extend it to make it happen because it's important. Um, to that, I would uh, hand it over to Chair Mariani. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I concur uh, with, with, with the Chair. Uh, of course, you and I spent a lot of time this summer <laughs> uh, uh, working on this. Um, let me just say, first of all, right off the bat, I, I, I support the amendment. Uh, Representative Marquardt and I uh, had a good uh, conversation about this uh, uh, most recently. I've been uh, publicly on the record, um, you know, expressing um, my support for making sure that law enforcement has the time to properly train um, its um, uh, its personnel on on the new standards. You know, the important thing, you know, it's not lose sight, right? The important thing is that uh, the new standards are going to be properly used. In order to do that, you've got to make sure you got the training. I, I, I would be remiss, however, if I didn't say a couple things uh, very quickly. Uh, one is that the timeline for the training. Um, came as a result of law enforcement being at the table and agreeing to that timeline. Um, the standard itself is not in question. Representative Marquardt is correct. You know, law enforcement agreed to those new uh, uh, standards. So the Representative Moran, myself, and many others, you know, uh, uh, brought forward uh, uh, last summer. Um, so it's a remarkable, you know, kind of thing. You know, we've got that. Uh, it was hard to negotiate it, but, but you have that kind of agreement. Some law enforcement entities have already trained their individuals, their, their personnel uh, to do this. So what, so it wasn't impossible uh, for all law enforcement, but there may be lots of reasons why others uh, were not able to do it. And so again, it's really important uh, that we uh, provide the time that's needed. When this bill came out of um, the markup from our committee, we actually had extended uh, the time out uh, a couple of months. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable at all with uh, Representative Marquardt uh, has before us. Uh, I think the important thing again is that we uh, continue to hold to those high standards uh, and new standards that were um, uh, very carefully uh, deliberated uh, and that are very meaningful 
uh, to the people of Minnesota, uh, particular, in particular many communities who feel that uh, they've been on the wrong end, you know, of that type of, 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 of use of force. And so, uh, members, I, I, I support the amendment in the spirit of what this bill is about, which is how do we continue to uh, push forward with new standards for quality um, that reflect, um, you know, the best of who we are at the same time that we're properly resourcing um, our uh, public safety and, and, and collection systems in our state. So uh, there have been no other questions. Uh, Chair Marquardt renews his motion to adopt the A46 amendments. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, all opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Thank Representative you, Chair. Yes, absolutely. Representative O'Neill, would you like to move and explain your A47 amendments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, the A47 is to the provisions of the bill that we already heard with Representative Moeller, House File 707, the rewrite of the criminal sexual conduct statutes. So this gets it in the same shape as the bill that we already had earlier. And um, it's, I, she already explained it, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, uh, Chair Mayrani, would you like to respond to the A47? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, members, I, I support this. Uh, this is good work. You've, you've already heard it. You know, we passed that uh, working group um, three years ago. Um, and um, in many ways, it's really surpassed what we had hoped uh, would happen. There's still a lot of work uh, to be done, but this is really well constructed, um, a proper policy that, that um, really honors, um, you know, uh, where victims um, uh, have historically been in sexual uh, assault in our state and our drive uh, to make sure that we put an end to this. So uh, really good work. Um, uh, encourage everyone to support the amendment. Uh, I don't see any hands up for questions. So with that, Representative O'Neill renews her motion to adopt the A47 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Chair Becker Finn, would you like to move and explain your A49 amendment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would move the A49 amendment. Uh, this am amendment is related to traffic stops. It would prohibit an officer for stopping a vehicle for the following violations, um, unless the officer stopped or detained the driver for an otherwise lawful reason or if the vehicle is unoccupied. And so uh, the offenses uh, listed would be vehicle registration, muffler required, uh, exceeding motor vehicle noise limits, uh, windshield prohibitions, and there are two different windshield prohibitions, and this one is uh, regarding having something hanging from your uh, rear view mirror, uh, restrictions on mirrored or glazed windows, and uh, license plate violation, uh, so you're missing your tabs uh, on your license plates. Um, there is a second list of uh, of things that you could not pull somebody over just for that reason, unless there's a second category met. And so for example, these are uh, equipment violations such as uh, headlamps, uh, license plate illumination, uh, your brake lights, your uh, use of headlight, you know, whether you had them on or off. Um, in essentially in discussing with law enforcement um, made the very good point that, you know, there is a difference between having one brake light out and having no brake lights working whatsoever. And so, um, you know, in recognition that if there is that otherwise uh, dangerous condition existing, that they would still be able to make the stop for that reason. Um, this would not stop, uh, would not stop officers from uh, ticketing somebody again if the vehicle is unoccupied, so if a vehicle is parked, um, and would not stop them from giving the citation if they've pulled them over for an otherwise uh, valid reason. Um, obviously, this is very uh, an issue that's very top of mind for a lot of people right now, uh, given what, uh, what happened over the weekend. Um, I do want to know, because I think this is really important, that um, there is a so some data that we have from the Stanford Open Policing Project that shows that in, in some areas, including St. Paul, uh, black drivers are more than three times likely to be pulled over uh, than white drivers. And so I, and I do want to uh, speak back to um, the work that we did over the summer, Chair Moran uh, and, and some of the others on this committee on the uh, Select Committee on Racial Justice to just point out that racism is a system. 
Um, it is not an individual character flaw or personal moral failing. It is a system of power that advantages and disadvantages uh, different people based on racial characteristics. And so it is. Uh, this is meant to uh, deal with that issue as we, we have the data that shows that that is a problem and uh, happy to answer questions and would uh, hope that members can support this amendment. Members who have any questions to the amendment today, 49. Um, Representative uh, O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Becker, uh, Representative Becker Finn. I just have a really quick question because I'm thinking about the TAPS portion of it in particular. And what is the another mechanism um, to collect the TAPS fee? Can you just explain that process? Because I know that's a little bit confusing and, and maybe the state would lose some revenue or, um, you know, like when they do finally go to do their tabs, is there an additional like kind of late fee or can you just explain that part to the committee so that we understand that people aren't gonna just suddenly stop paying their tabs? I'm guessing that people will still pay some tabs, but can you just explain sort of this kind of the mechanism to enforce it? Here, Becca Fan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question. And I, I do want to clarify that this is not saying that you can't cite somebody for not having their tabs updated. It's saying that that can't be the primary reason that you originally pulled somebody over for a traffic stop. So, uh, you know, you would still be expected to pay your tabs the way that all of us are expected to pay, uh, pay our tabs. And um, as far as revenue, I mean, it may be the difference is if we want to catch people not paying uh, their uh, making sure that their tabs are updated. Um, it, you know, this does lay out that, uh, you know, the vehicles unoccupied, this could be the primary um, citation if the car is parked somewhere. Uh, so you'd still have that enforcement mechanism. If you're driving out, driving around with uh, your pat, your tabs uh, behind, um, you, you run pretty much still a high risk of having, uh, getting a citation for that, but it would not be the primary reason that an officer would initiate that traffic stop and that, that, you know, potential confrontation with somebody. Representative O'Neill. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, um, I was hoping that you could let us know like what the mechanism is now or are you you know considering maybe adding late fees or something if somebody you know is a year late or two years late or three years late or whatever to renew their tabs i mean is that is that something that you've thought through on this i understand that about pulling somebody over for tabs but if there's not a hard and fast penalty for not paying tabs people may not want to pay tabs hmm. um Chair becker uh, it, Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, that's not contemplated within this bill. The, the focus of this bill is on the traffic stops, um, since that is where we have the data to show the disparities and show the difference. Um, so that is the focus of, of this amendment. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I, you know, we could have that conversation and go down that rabbit hole, but this is specifically about uh, traffic stops. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair becker -Finn. It, it It's funny because just two days ago, I ran, I drove tabs down to my daughter who lives in South Minneapolis because she was late from October. So she's a front care, frontline healthcare worker. And honestly, she just was absolutely overwhelmed with all of it and is exhausted from over a year of being face-to-face -face with COVID patients. So um, she got behind and she got pulled over and um, She's like, mom, I got to get it done right now. So she took the time she had to take to come back to Wright County to go and, you know, do all the stuff for tabs. And then she's calling me and it turned into a much bigger deal than I would have expected. But um, my concern is that, you know, if unless there's some sort of mechanism that a late fee or some other thing happening that, you know, people will just kind of forget and just sort of stop, you know, not renew them. People get busy and things happen. So I was just... I'm not sure, and I see where and Peter Petersburg might actually have more to say because he's on transportation, but we definitely want people to keep paying their tabs, but I just I was just concerned about that. I literally just did this two days ago for my daughter. Yeah, I can agree with you, Representative O'Neill. You know, during this pandemic with the DVS being closed and shut down, you know, it was a huge backup when it comes to folks not having any tabs. That is like common. I mean, I think it's like over 100,000 people who, and I may not have the exact number, who 
had not and have not gotten their tabs, you know. Um, but I never equated that not by police stopping that we would not get our tabs, right? So that's an interesting thought, um, you know, but yeah. So Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to follow right up with Representative O'Neill. Uh, it's not just tabs, it's also insurance. Um, and the primary enforcement that we have for whether or not people uh, keep their tabs on is, is the police officer who, who stops people. And the reason why I say it and deals with, with insurance as well is because if, if there's no enforcement, in other words, there's no need to worry about whether the police are gonna stop you because you don't have your tabs on, you can be one month, two months, three months late uh, without having to worry about that as long as you don't do anything else wrong, okay? Uh, but that is also the only time in which the state can verify that you have insurance on your vehicle. And whereas I understand that there are people that, that get insurance for a month, get their license tabs, and then, and then uh, uh, stop, stop, stop coverage. This is really problematic in us trying to keep not only the public safe, but also to make sure that we have uh, insurance coverage so that when somebody's in an accident, they can be held accountable uh, for, for what's going on. So this is very problematic. And I, I'm wondering if, if um, Representative Becker Finn can, can tell me where else the enforcement was. I mean, she, I heard her say, well, parking. So, so we want the parking and the uh, uh, parking enforcement to, to maybe verify all of that. But more cars are out either in people's garage or driving on the roads. And it's a lot easier for police officers to do that. And it's been set up for a long time that the enforcement for our, our uh, tabs has been with the police officers and, and uh, highway patrol. And so why add that part? Uh, I mean, the rest of them I, I can understand, but uh, because they're not necessarily moving violations, but I think the state has a big interest in making sure that not only cars are registered, but that they also have insurance. And it seems to me, when we take out the idea of enforcement, uh, that that's a problem. If Representative Beckerfin could, could address that. Chair Beckerfin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I do want to highlight, I think, uh, you know, your, your questions are good and that they're, they're going to allow me to highlight that um, you can still issue citations for uh, not having your tabs updated or not having uh, proof of insurance. Uh, if you're pulled over for literally any other reason, but for the, the couple of reasons listed in, uh, in this amendment. So, uh, you know, as far as the enforcement uh, mechanism, it's still there. Um, I mean, how many Many of, of us on this call have been uh, pulled over for speeding uh, or any other kind of moving violation. You know, all those things would still apply. And if they pull you over for any of those other reasons other than, uh, you know, the, the six things listed in this amendment, they can still give you a ticket for that. Um, I would also urge, I would hope that the only reason uh, that people uh, are following the law is not just because they're worried about getting caught. Um, so I, I should hope that think that folks are um, paying their tabs and following the law, uh, regardless of whether they think they're going to get pulled over or not. Um, Representative Petersburg. Um, you know, thank you for, for that. But I think uh, if I choose to be careful in how I drive and, uh, and not, and just go to uh, uh, parking areas where we're like Walmarts and go to my garage, I could go years without not only, not only paying for the tabs, but no insurance. That's a big deal. That's a big cost. And for people uh, that we know um, are dealing with uh, difficulties with finances and others, uh, that may be something that they choose to do. And we have no way of, of addressing that because you, as you said, this can't be a primary a reason for pulling over somebody to, to deal with those tabs. And yet to me, that's a big deal. And to me, that's a safety issue. And just as much as you're concerned about uh, not having people pulled over for that purpose. Uh, I don't think this should be uh, racially motivated or not, whether or not we have tabs on our car or not, I think this is something that we need to always do. And I, I'm sure that you didn't mean to say that that there is no incentive um, because there's going to be enforcement. 
uh, that that therefore you don't need to have it. I just don't think this is the proper place for that portion of the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Scott, would you like to speak now? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and um, I I am intrigued by this um, amendment, and we heard it yesterday in your committee. And my concern with it is primarily with the tabs piece. And I see, you know, Representative Hornstein is on this call, <laughs> and. I feel like this should have gone through transportation because I feel like there's going to be a fiscal note to this um, that, that they're not going to be collecting so much on those um, tab fees. And I just don't know if he has an idea of, of you know, when, how much uh, law enforcement stop to enforce this law contributes to people actually paying their tabs. So I guess my first question would be to Representative Hornstein to see if he has any ideas on that. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Scott. I did have a conversation. Uh, we had a, a, a com communication with uh, Chair Becker Finn, and um, you know, I, I I understand your uh, uh, concern, Representative Scott. But I I think the this amendment really is in the purview of public safety and judiciary, um, and. Uh, Right now, I can tell you that the driver and vehicle services account um, is, uh, you know, is healthy, and um, you know, where I, I don't have, you know, particular concerns about that. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to Representative Hornstein. So, uh, Representative Petersburg brought up, you know, that somebody could drive around um, and obey every other traffic law. They could drive around for a few years without ever renewing their tabs and therefore without ever having to verify that they have insurance, they could let their insurance go. Does that concern you at all? Representative Weinstein? Um, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Scott, um, you know, I, I think it's definitely uh, an issue. I, I, we we want to make sure that everybody uh, is insured. We, we address that and, you know, that's one of the reasons we we have the license, driver's license for all, so we want to keep tabs on, on uh, making sure that it, clearly insurance is is key towards traffic safety. But uh, I I'm not convinced. Uh, just hearing uh, this uh, amendment now that that we're going to have those kinds of significant problems with this. Yeah, well, Representative Scott, I'm just thinking that you know, <clears throat> one, if this will have a fiscal impact. I think that's probably a problem too, that we are stopping poor people probably, you know, I hear through the study that blacks are stopped at three times the, the rate, you know, and not that I'm saying this is for expired tasks, that no means am I saying that. They are just generally stopped for that reason and other things happen. Um, and, you know, but I think we're making assumptions here that, you know, I would say there's probably some people who can't afford it today and are probably just taking a chance and don't have the tails and insurance. Or maybe I'm doing that like right now today. But I think we're making assumptions that just because the police cannot stop someone because they have no tabs, that um, that all of a sudden this law is going to just make more people be uh, illegal. Um, I mean, that's a big assumption that we're making, you know, um, in my opinion, about the impacts of, of, of this bill. You know, people get insurance because it's the law, not because they don't have tabs. And so, you know, this is my opinion. You know, I, I, I see uh, Chair Horstein has something well, he wants to say. So I'm well, going to pass it on to Chair Horstein. Thank you. I wish my um, the, that emoji for raising hand would work on my <laughs> computer, but it doesn't. Um, I, I wanted to echo uh, Chair Moran's uh, uh, comments, and you know, again, it's my understanding that um, you know DVS is able to um, uh, communicate with people who don't have uh, these uh, documents up to date, and you know, via letter, via other mechanisms, and you know that that, that system works. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Scott. Thank you. And, and so Representative Hornstein, 
uh, I haven't sat on transportation for since my very first term in the legislature. Yes. So refresh my I memory. Remember that. That, <laughs> and that was when when Ernie was there. Um, so my question is: is if you don't have tabs and if you don't have insurance, can you legally drive? And can you get a driver's license? I know you can get a driver's license because you don't have to have even a car to do that, but can it affect your driver's license if you do not have current tabs and current insurance on your vehicle? Rep uh, Chair Hornstein. Um, again, my understanding is that, um, you know, DVS would know, uh, you know, who is, who is paying, who isn't. Uh, there would be, I think the way it would be affected is that there, that individual would be communicated with via a letter and uh, there would be uh, action taken. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I'll just finish up here, but my concern is that I feel like this is being rushed through a little bit. I think we need to know, we, I think we need to hear from DPS if there would be financial consequences. I, I think that what Representative Becker Finn is putting forward here needs consideration but I don't want to have a knee-jerk reaction without this going through the proper channels um, so that we know what the outcome is going to be. And Representative Moran or Chair Moran to, you know, the fact that some people may be driving around without tabs because they can't afford it. You know, we've passed all sorts of reforms. Um, and in fact, the judiciary bill and, and probably the, pub, I don't know about public safety, but you know, we're, we're already um, eliminating that $75 surcharge for um, low-income folks, indigenous, or um, uh, what's the word, um, indigent people. Um, and, and yesterday we heard a bill on, on um, legalizing pot, and there was a $1,000 fine if you as an individual are caught with more than the legal amount. And I don't know how many people of low income would be able to pay that. So. I just don't want us to go down the road of because you don't have um, means that you don't have to obey the law. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I, I voted for these other provisions, but I, we have to draw the line somewhere. And so this is the provision in the, the amendment that troubles me probably the most. The other things I think we need to look at and I'm not a hard no on the, the concept, but I just think that this needs to be vetted better before we adopt an amendment like this. Uh, thank you, Madam um, Chair. Thank you. Representative Garofalo? I'm sorry, I think it's, I should go to Representative uh, Liebling. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I don't wanna prolong this, but I just really wanted to put a little different perspective on this. and. A couple things. First of all, when Representative O'Neill talked about her daughter being stopped, I just thought, how much privilege I have as a white person. You know, when a trooper stops me, and it's happened, I got stopped for expired tabs, I get really nervous. No reason I should, but I do. I can only imagine, if I was a person of color, how that would make me feel, just to be stopped. You don't, you don't know why you're being stopped when you get stopped, and, and you don't know what's going to happen. So I just want to remind people of that scenario. Secondly, and probably most important, a lot of you, I know, don't like big government. You think government should be smaller, less intrusive in people's lives. So let's back up and think about this for a moment. Police are, when they stop a citizen, they are infringing on that person's freedom. You can be driving down the street thinking about Whatever's going on with your day, you've got something, and suddenly your freedom is interrupted there. Even if only briefly, you are stopped and detained, even for a brief time, by the police. Now, there are a lot of good reasons that we allow that, a lot of important reasons. But think about it. What this is saying is that some infringements, some, some infringements of law do not rise to the level of having government literally stop you in your movement and intervene in your life to get you to be in compliance with some small law. That's what this is about. 
This is about how much government intrusion should we allow to literally stop citizens in their tracks to enforce a law. So I'm not going to discuss the whole thing about whether people would comply. I think they still would. But I, even if, even if, you know, I guess we will find out. But I, you know, we have allowed this for so long that we become used to it. But it really is very intrusive to have the police stop you when you're driving down the street. And we should really think about how much of that intrusion we should allow for very, very minor reasons. And especially when we know that sometimes those very minor reasons can result in a very terrible consequence. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Leadley. Representative Garofalo. Um, Madam Chair, you can go to Representative Hurt Toss in Petersburg before me. Thank you. Pardon me, I'm sorry. Oh, can you repeat yourself, uh, Representative? Um, Garofalo? Madam Chair, I see that Representatives Hurtas and Petersburg have their hands raised. Do you, um, if you can, call on them, and I'll just close up for our side. All right, thank you, uh, Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, Representative Becker Finn. I clearly understand what your intent is, and is to reduce interactions between law enforcement and minority people. Um, You've cited statistics, and I don't doubt that there's some validity to that. Um, reducing probable cause uh, can obviously uh, be a factor in uh, what uh, comes about here. But um, would you say that <clears throat> you mentioned you only had a half a dozen? I'm looking at a at a list here of, of twelve different things that could be or or can no longer be used as probable cause to be stopped. Uh, would it be your intent that more than one of these uh, on a single occurrence would be reason for probable cause or that none of these things, even if all of them existed, um, are not reasons to be pulled over? Represent Chair Bickerson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and so that is uh, so that is accurate as far as if it was. Uh, so I'm counting now on my one, two, three, four, five, six things um, that you couldn't have be the the, the primary cause that you're tr you're pulling somebody over. So yes, in theory, if you uh, had uh, something hanging from your windshield and you had expired tabs, those wouldn't add up to being enough that that would be something that we would pull somebody over for. I do want to clarify too that the majority of these are petty misdemeanors. So we're talking, these are very low level um, uh, offenses that we're talking about. And I also want to point out, so there's kind of two steps within the bill. So there's there's the list of six things that would be, um, that we're calling mandatory secondary offenses so that they couldn't be the primary reason that you pulled somebody over. And then in that second category um, are things that are more related to safety and equipment. And you could still, an officer could still pull somebody over, for example, if they have headlights and none of them are functioning. If, if one of them is out, that wouldn't be enough. But if if both of them are out, then that would be enough. And, and that essentially is looking at, um, you know, we, we defined what a dangerous condition is, uh, a situation where an improper or malfunctioning piece of motor vehicle equipment creates a substantial identifiable risk to human life. Um, so, you know, I don't think whether you have uh, an air freshener and uh, expired tabs doesn't collectively make it more dangerous. Uh, so you are correct that you couldn't sort of um, add those up to get to a, you know, what would be considered a, a dangerous condition. Representative Hotas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you for your clarification on that, uh, Representative. Um, you know, would you agree that um, we have long held that, that operating a motor vehicle and driving is a privilege in this state and not a right? Uh, Chair becker -Fan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think that's an accurate uh, description of our law, yes. Represent Hotas. Well, thank you, and, and I think everybody does understand that. Um, however, you know, this is all in the arena of public safety, and uh, clearly uh, for these some of these types of things, uh, clearly uh, vehicle tabs are expired, that probably doesn't make your vehicle any less safe, but some of the other uh, 
items listed uh, certainly do. And, you know, I thought it was interesting that, you know, I, I would hope that everybody aspires to one day own their own car or their own new vehicle. It took me a number of years when I was young before I could afford my first new vehicle. And certainly nobody uh, wants to sell you a new vehicle any any harder than a, a car dealership. And uh, they make every opportunity to make it uh, fit your budget. But um, I found it interesting that just a couple of days ago, we were talking about amending with regard to a revenue stream to MnDOT ending the depreciation schedule, which would actually discourage people from buying new vehicles because of the higher tab fees that would be uh, persistent uh, for a greater number of years before it would start to decline. And uh, I would hope that we want to <clears throat> certainly uh, implore upon people to be able to keep uh, their vehicles safe and that this is part of public safety. Um, I don't support uh, a lot of these things that are on here. I have, when I served on public safety, I uh, chimed in and advocated for uh, acknowledging that once you're kind of in the law's snare, it's difficult to get out of it. And I have uh, favored uh, allowing people uh, once uh, cited for an infraction to have uh, alternative methods of not having their driver's license revoked if they continue to drive on tabs to have a payment plan or, you know, they have to get to work, they have to of their families, those things are all important. And this certainly, what you're proposing would contribute to decreasing a bunch of these cumulative petty misdemeanor fines for people who have vehicles that are really not up to standard as we've decided. Uh, the muffler prohibition, uh, stopping for that, you know, we're building uh, walls around our freeway systems to inhibit noise. Um, I, I, I would have concerns about that. But just in closing, um, I thought it was curious uh, that we just heard testimony about the intrusions into our private lives by government. And yet we've been living uh, for 13 months with an intrusion into our lives on where we can go, when we can go, how we can go, what we have to wear. Uh, so I, I think it really quite ironic that we would be uh, talking about intrusions into our life when we're talking about public safety here going to be consistent on that. Let's be consistent about it all the way. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I, I will just refer, I think, earlier to something you said where we don't think that people will feel illegal by not paying their tabs. And I think I want to remind us that uh, all of these situations that we have, it's currently illegal to do. And so basically what we're asking uh, police officers to do is when they witness these illegal acts, that they need to turn their eye and not enforce them. To me, I think that's a very slippery slope. I think we heard earlier also, well, these are just petty misdemeanors. So where does it stop? Are we now going to make it carte blanche that, well, if any petty misdemeanor, we don't need to worry about police officers if they see them to enforce it only if it's something secondary. That's a very dangerous slope to go on to. And, and I don't think that's what we really want to do. This is an opportunity for us to say, no, um, we need people to abide by what is legal and not legal. And police officers, because of their, their reason for them is public safety is to protect us from illegal acts. And certainly um, just as we heard, well, just a minor event and it could escalate it also could de-escalate something else happening it also is important for people to to have a better uh interaction with police officers and maybe that's the direction we should go is to help train in de-escalation of, of traffic stops so that they aren't quite so apprehensive or maybe we need to, to eliminate some of these as being illegal uh, if that's the case but in either case, right now we have the laws on the book and we need to, I believe, ask our law enforcement to enforce them. We do call them law enforcement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Representative Becker-Finn, there's been a couple of members in the committee who 
have said, you know, Representative Becker, fan, you're trying to do this or your goal in this is doing this. I just think it's important that you restate what you are intending to do um, with this legislation before I before I make a comment like that. I want to just make sure I like what, when the purpose of you introducing this amendment, what is it? What is the goal you're trying to accomplish or goals? Chair Becker, fan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And while noting that um, my motives are not uh, not relevant, uh, I, I will note that the intention of this bill is to reduce traffic stops for these listed uh, petty misdemeanor issues that are listed in this bill. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Becker. Uh, Representative Garofalo. You know, this is one of those debates where I really wish we were all in the same room because, like, when you said that, I was like, Oh, no, 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 Representative Becker Finn, I didn't mean it that way. And then I looked at the screen and I can kind of tell you were grinning. So I was like, oh, she's kind of poking me a little bit. Okay, all right. So I, I think that's what you were doing there. Um, but I do, uh, in seriousness, um, and I know you have a law degree. I dropped out of law school after half a semester, so I always get concerned whenever I bring up law. But in terms of trying to reduce the amount of interactions, the amount of stops uh, between law enforcement and individuals, my understanding was always that you didn't need uh, a police officer did not need probable cause to stop someone, whether it's on the street or pulling a vehicle over that the, the, the legal standard was a much lower legal standard, that it was just simply an articulable suspicion that if someone asks a police officer, hey, why did you stop someone that it's pretty much if they can just articulate a non illegal version than they can. And so whenever we make things primary offenses or secondary offenses, it doesn't really matter. Um, that, that was my understanding of what the legal standard is to stop someone. And, and, am I mistaken or can you give me, give me a little more of a, um, an in, um, informed viewpoint on that? Chair Beckerson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, you are correct. So it is not probable cause. It's a reasonable suspicion, which is a lower standard. Uh, but this would mean that they would still have to articulate what that was outside of, you know, just using the shorthand of saying, oh, because his tabs were expired. Oh, because uh, he had, it looked like he had something hanging from his, you know, hanging from the mirror. You know, you would have to articulate those things and be able to, uh, you know, you would still have to articulate what that uh, reasonable suspicion is. Okay, so. Representative um, Garofalo. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, Representative Becker Finn. So, again, as long as the officer didn't state in a legal version, like you can say, I'm pulling them over uh, for reasons A, B, C, and as long as any of those things weren't prohibited in law, it really it doesn't matter. I, am I, I mean, isn't that isn't that why they're able to stop so many people right now? It's not because they're stopping them for tabs. It's just maybe that's the most convenient reason. But if someone crosses the white line or touches the white line when they're driving their car, that's an articulable suspicion. If a person's going 54 and a 55 or 56 and a 55, that's an articulable suspicion. And so um, when Representative Liebling's comments are made, I actually, um, it was really um, enlightening to hear that. I mean, I think back to when we made um, seatbelts, prime uh, seatbelts, not wearing a seatbelt, a primary offense. And that was, a, that was a vigorous debate in the House of Representatives. There were a lot of Democrats who were getting up and making some of the arguments that Representative Liebling has made um, today. And so it's refreshing to hear that, but am I misunderstanding? Like, I think people may be kind of over, what's the way, they're, they're making the significance of this amendment either bigger than it really is. But at the end of the day, if a cop can articula articulate a lawful reason for why they were suspicious to pull you over, they can still do it. Represent our chair backer fan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, you make an excellent point. Uh, you know, law enforcement, you know, peace officers have an incredible power uh, to pull people over for, for many reasons. And I think, um, you know, what we're saying, you know, what, what this, this amendment is saying is that you would have to be forced to articulate what that is, and you couldn't use this shorthand. And, you know, your reasoning 
couldn't be based on something uh, that is, uh, you know, discriminatory or otherwise unreasonable uh, under our law. You know, you would have to do that. So, uh, you know, and in, in conversations with law enforcement, if, if you really wanted to pull somebody over, it doesn't take long to find one of those other reasons uh, to pull somebody over. But we're saying you can't use these, you know, and I, I will also note a petty misdemeanor is technically not even a crime. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, under, under our law. And so uh, it's saying that you can't use that shorthand. You have to articulate why you did it. And it has to be more than one of these things. Okay. So Madam Chair, and Representative yeah, Fenn, uh, thanks for elaborating on that. And again, I think many of the things that you said would need to take place um, under this law already take place right now. You're just, you're just eliminating some of those reasons that could be listed as an art as meeting the articulable suspicion uh, standard. But I, I can't let you. I, I can't have this reasonable conversation with you. I, I have to leave with some sort of pointed comment. That's you know. I I got to maintain my street cred. So, I guess what I'll say is that what you know when you and Representative Hornstein are working on transportation issues and your efforts to reduce greenhouse gases, I think you're going to be banning cars anytime you know sometime soon. Anyways, so this isn't going to matter anyways. You're going to you know with your clean car standards and stuff, you're just going to you're going to be prohibiting cars and making us take bicycles everywhere anyways. But uh, Representative becker Fan, I'll be voting no on your amendment, but I do think that there is a longer conversation we can have about the overall standards for when uh, law enforcement entities are stopping people, whether they're walking or driving. And I think that's a serious conversation to have. Um, certainly current events are driving this conversation right now, and you should be commended for, uh, even though I'm voting against your amendment, you should be complimented on advancing the agenda. So thank you. Chair Mariani. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Since it's my bill that's being amended, I thought I should <laughs> comment uh, as well. And, um, you know, there's so much to say. And, and, and right off the bat, what I want to say is, well, one, that I, I support this amendment, and I'll explain um, uh, in a second. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that just the fact that we've had this discussion, this debate, uh, to me suggests that there is, in fact, something here. And uh, I really did appreciate Representative Scott, uh, you know, expressing, uh, you know, not like this firm, you know, uh, bad idea, don't do it all. Uh, you know, that uh, she, she said, this needs consideration. And the question really becomes, you know, uh, where do you draw the line, if you will? Um, you know, um, this is before us because of the moment that's in front of us. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's just being honest. You know, uh, another uh, black, young black man was killed um, following um, uh, a stop um, that uh, began in this way. Um, you know, my whole family has faced this. Um, you know, half of my family are way lighter than I am and half of them are way darker than than, than I am, and I've had, I've had uh, in particular African-American young uh, loved ones uh, who have uh, been stopped, uh, uh, in my opinion, inappropriate because there was never a citation or anything, but in one case, one led to a pretty close to tragic uh, uh, outcome. Uh, I can tell you that this, this young man's life, uh, who was a college student at that time, uh, became it was greatly diverted. Uh, the trauma of it. Uh, he never finished college, and it's it's a long story. So I'm not I'm not going to get into it. But you know we've heard about the dangerous you know slippery slope. We're on one. We're on one right now. Um, this effort is about, as I understand it, Representative Macrofani. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this effort. Um, is a response to reality in our society. And it's about minimizing the interaction um, between um, armed uh, public agents, people that we license, that I, I, you know, I support a good licensing program. Uh, and I do support uh, uh, peace officers, you know, they have that kind of power uh, as long as they also have the training uh, and the wisdom. But we know our society. Uh, and the more opportunities that we present for interaction uh, between uh, that professional uh, class of public agents and particular community, uh, I believe that the greater the odds are we're going to wind up with more dead uh, people of color. 
sounds brutal, you know, but I mean, that that's, you know, and so, you know, they're not just law enforcement, they're peace officers. Representative Moran, you said that during the summer when we were debating uh, and interacting with our law enforcement uh, professionals, and you kept emphasizing, I really want to talk about uh, the, the title peace officers. You know, it's about keeping peace. It isn't just about enforcement because that's devoid uh, of that much higher value. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't be tough or hold people accountable, but you do it within a culture of peace. And that's what citizens and residents, we want to all live our lives safely and, and peacefully. So I, I believe what you're trying to do, Representative Beckerfin, and I love uh, Representative Garofalo's uh, you know, inquiries, uh, you're trying to impact culture. Uh, you're, you're trying to set expectations that are normed uh, by our society. Um, and it's just not normal to be uh, pulling over people left and right, you know, over petty misdemeanors. You know, given the fact that we live in the society that we live in, that that means that that's going to probably lead, depending on who the, the actors are, to a pretty bad and sometimes tragic uh, situation. Can we at least minimize that? Uh, I think that's the approach that you're doing here. You know, whether you know we draw the line, you know, at, at one particular you know, uh, violation or, or another. That is, in fact, you know, to represent Scott's point, debatable. We still have time to do that. We do, you know, if this goes on, this can still be amendable. The conversation can still uh, happen uh, going forward. I think there's reasonable people here who have a lot in common that can get to that really good place. Um, and preferably, we probably would have done it months ago, but Sunday happened last Sunday, you know, and that's why it's before us. So I really thank you for bringing it in. And uh, I'll struggle with this along with, you know, all my colleagues here, uh, but I would, uh, I would encourage your support for the amendment. All right. Well, thank you. And I usually do not talk after you, Carlos. Ah, but, no, <laughs> but I do want to also say that, you know, let's be frank and let's be transparent about and I'm sure we all know why this bill is before us today, because way too many black boys and men have been stopped by police officers, you know, for petty misdemeanors. And the outcome has not been good or been fair or been just. There is a history here that we cannot negate you know, um, and as a, as a culture and as a society in America, you know, we use the word peace officer legislatively, but that is not the words that is used out on the streets. It is policing. It's the policing. And we don't have to be a culture of policing. They're there to serve and protect. We forget about that. When you rural folks talk about policing and your local law enforcement, you talk about how the connection is between you and your neighbors and you go to church together and you go to the store together and, you, and your kids are attending the same school. But that has not been the encounters that we saw, that we see often in the urban core between the black communities and many communities of color. And so, you know, Yes, we want safe communities. And matter of fact, we, we demand it. But we also want it to be from those who are there to help to serve and protect us. That's not asking a lot. But it is to be expected. And so, you know, what we have is Jamie Ch Chair Becker Finn really is bringing about a culture shift about how we look at the interactions of policing, which we want it to be about a peace officer, interaction with cars. Blacks are three times as likely to be stopped. Not often because they're doing anything wrong. It could be because of some of the things that Representative Garofalo said, that a police see them and just say, mm, that's the reason to stop them, just because, because I have the power to do that. 
And so, you know, um, I think this is the minimum that we can do right now at this moment in the 21st century, as we look at, you know, policing and, you know, I would love to have the red traffic lights up and the police ought to even take care of that when someone goes through a red light. They get a ticket sent to their homes. How about that? So how do we minimize these encounters? And this is just one way of doing that, you know, and I, I just um, believe it's a good amendment. I support it. And I hope the um, members of the Ways and Means can support this amendment also. And so with that, um, Chair Becker Finn, Chair uh, Mariani, uh, the chair would renew uh, Chair Becker Finn renews her motion to adopt the A49 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. The motion no. fails and the amendment is adopted. To the bill. Um, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Chair. Chair Becker Finn, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank members and uh, for or, you know, I think what's been a, a very good conversation about a very important issue. And I, I appreciate the support uh, for this amendment. And I, um, I did want to state for the record, um, since Representative Garofalo did not finish law school, I just wanted to make it clear that uh, reasonable suspicion is of a criminal activity. Uh, those of us who are attorneys, uh, you know, that kind of goes without saying, but I, I did, I did want to just clarify that. Um, and again, I thank members for the really good discussion and your support today. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn. Okay, so <clears throat> to House File uh, 1078, members, do you have any questions to the bill? Okay. Um, so if there is no further dis. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, Representative Johnson. Representative Johnson. Uh, find my the right buttons here so I can get unmuted. Okay. I do have uh, a one quest, one quick question uh, on this bill. Uh, Rep Representative Mariani, I'm just wondering. Oh, you have a grant program for our policy and uh, training consultant costs. I don't have the page number in front of me. Uh, but one of the lines in it, it's, it's, uh, requires 15 years experience developing and implementing law enforcement policy. Um, I've gone through, and I know there's, there's a number of very good uh, companies that uh, provide this service to different departments, all, not only in Minnesota and all across the country. I'm just wondering why you listed uh, 15 years when there is only one company that would qualify for that. Chair Mariani. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Re Representative Johnson, um, uh, I mean, the, the short of it is because uh, we really want a quality, um, you know, uh, consultant. Um, uh, there is uh, one that fits that. Uh, particular um, uh, description. There may be others. Um, I don't know, uh, but uh, I truly don't know. Uh, but um, uh, the idea is to get at um, national best standards level uh, of work um, uh, that is, um, you know, supported by deep experience, uh, you know, good objective uh, research. Um, I am certainly open, um, you know, to um, uh, adjusting that. Um, uh, you have much more experience in this area than I do, and so I, I would certainly be open uh, to that kind of guidance. The, the important thing here is that uh, the state is uh, communicating um, throughout the state that it expects the highest quality professional standards. Um, which I, I believe all our locals want to do as well, um, which is why we created, uh, we're proposing uh, to create a way in which we can provide resources uh, for those uh, local um, 
law enforcement units to be able to achieve those standards. Representative Johnson. Uh, uh, Chair, Chair, Moran, Chair Mariani, yeah, I was just uh, curious because like I say, there's a number of them that uh, uh, the departments across the state already use. Uh, some have contracts that uh, that haven't been around for three years, four years. Mm -hmm. Some have only one's been around over 12 and that's uh, Lexipool. And they've been around, I believe about 16 years. But even the, the new ones out there, they're very good. Uh, they look at and find out what's best standards. Uh, a lot of them are the same, use the, use the exact same policies because they each one looks at different areas depending on what's going on and tweaking their policies regularly. And they all, last I heard, they all have training programs built into them. So every day the officers are training on them. The other question, I have one other question before I make my final comments on this bill. Uh, one thing you do, and I saw in the amendment, you reduce the amount that uh, comes out of the MinCor balance. What I'm wondering, what after you take out the 5.7 some million dollars and transfer it out of the MinCor account in the Department of Corrections, uh, how much funds is left in that account? Chair Mariani. Uh, uh, Madam Chair uh, and Representative Johnson, my understanding is that that is a fungible a number because there is activity there, uh, even though it is a fund balance. And uh, you know, I I, um, I I turn to our you know for a technical answer, I would turn to our fiscal uh, staff. But even they, I suspect, are only dealing with a number that's you know that shifts up and down, but. Uh, perhaps our, our fiscal staff might be able to uh, get you a number close to, to or a close enough answer to, uh, on what a number is. Representative Johnson. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I guess uh, an a non-answer answer. Mm. But uh, my final comments on this bill. The uh, the cumulative effect of this, and it even got, uh, I think it got worse today. Uh, there are some good things in this bill, but there's a lot of uh, bad things. The, co the community effect of everything in this bill is hostile to law, not only to law enforcement, but to the safety of the citizens of Minnesota. Right now, we're currently at a shortage of highly qualified uh, candidates uh, for many of the open positions in law enforcement across the state. This bill will not only drive highly qualified officers that we have now out of the profession, it will, it will also not attract new qualified recruits. While, while the bill lets uh, criminals out of the prison and seals their records from public view, making our communities across Minnesota less safe. In 1978, Minnesota was the leader in this. It established the post board. And it was, it was established to provide training objectives and licensing for peace officers across the state. The state has been at the forefront and still have, has some of the most highly qualified officers in this country. And I think what this uh, bill is going to do is make it so we do not have officers. I don't know if that's the goal or not, but that's uh, what it's pushing to. And I, uh, We'll talk more about that uh, when this comes to the floor. But I also want to point out that this bill is, is not supported but opposed by the sheriffs and chiefs of Minnesota. It's opposed by the Minnesota Peace and Peace Officers Association. And the League of Minnesota Cities and the Association of Minnesota Counties have some concerns on this bill. And with that, I would. Uh, suggest to the members that we do not support this bill at this time and send it back, get it done properly. That'll actually make uh, the citizens of this state safer. Thank you. Representative Hassan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair and members, it's with a heavy heart and a lot of pain that I speak with you today on the matter of public safety. Not only as your colleague, but as a mother, 
as a woman of faith, as a fellow Minnesotan, and as a fellow human being. Before I become too sentimental and emotional, I wanted to immensely thank Chair Mariani, Chair um, Becker Finn, and their team for all their dedication and commitment to justice. Duante Wright died in the hands of police on April uh, 11, 2021. He was a son, a very young father, and a member of our community. He will never see his son Junior grow up, and that is tragic. No matter what crime someone commits, it's not the job of the police to act as the judge, the jury, and the whole justice system. We, the public, pay police officers to serve and protect us, not to kill us. Last year, when George Floyd was killed and my city burned down, I was unable to express my sorrow as that tragedy was too close to home. Seven months later, my nephew, Dolal Eid, was gunned down by police. I was too devastated to find the words to share with you the hole that left in my heart. So I'm taking this chance today to share with you how violence against Black people in this state is devastating communities across the state and across the country. I'm a mother of two kids, a 17-year-old son and an 18-month-old daughter. The most beautiful thing about being a mother, about mother's heart, is it's filled with love and protection. We would protect and shelter our children no matter the outcome. I go to sleep every night thinking about the first interaction my son will have to, with the police and will he ever walk away from that interaction safe to come home to us. Many white parents do not have to have the talk with their children, but we do. I started having the talk with my son when he was only 10 years old. What's sad about that talk is how do you protect your child while you're teaching them to stand up for justice? I'm a woman of faith and serving justice no matter who it's for, is a central theme of my faith. It's my understanding that justice is intertwined with every religion. So I'm pleading with you, uh, with those of you who, have, who are people of faith, to stand up for justice. Justice for Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities across the state. Justice for all humans. I have a sense of pride, but I'm not too proud to beg all of you to stand on the right side of justice and help us save the next Duante Wright from being killed by police. When George Floyd was killed, if we have taken a bold stand on police accountability legislation, then we wouldn't be here talking about another life lost in the hands of police. Please help us protect my son and all the other black sons who will die in the hands of police if we do not do anything about police accountability. Please vote for this legislation and let's make sure Minnesota leads the way to ending police violence against black, brown, and indigenous communities across the state. The world is watching. Minnesotans across all walks of life are watching us. And your great, great grandkids will be glancing back on this pivotal moment for many years to come. Please vote yes. Thank you. Uh, there being no further discussion to the bill, I want to thank Chair Mariani. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Um... Uh, well, unless you want me to go after you, but um, yeah, yeah, no, I was just going to say, I just want to thank you for your continued work to bring reform to our criminal justice process, while continuing to ensure safety for all Minnesotans. And it's open to you. Thank Sarah. you. Um, I just, uh, I just want to say a few things, uh, uh, members. Uh, first of all, it's been a privilege for me to to chair this uh, committee. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, and, um, and I've met uh, just, you know, amazing, um, um, you know, uh, people in the state of Minnesota as a result of, of chairing this. And that includes uh, uh, a lot of folks in our peace officer um, community, our public safety community, uh, and our corrections community, uh, as well as, um, you know, frontline um, community activists, you know, some of them who, um, you know, as we speak right now, we're out there on the streets in uh, Brooklyn Center um, trying to uh, keep peace, uh, trying to intervene, uh, putting themselves, you know, physically on the line. Um, you know, there, there's just no way you can be involved in public safety and corrections and not uh, see the best of who we are uh, as a people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there will be times when you will see the worst of who we are. Uh, as well, and it's the role of, of, of you know, governments, the role of the legislature to create the structures, the frameworks, and the resources um, to um, 
uh, bring out and uh, reward and support the best uh, and to make sure that the worst are no longer a part of our systems. Um, that's true in any sector, uh, whether it's healthcare, transportation, uh, education, uh, you name it, uh, it's vitally important in public safety. Um, I, I typically don't respond, you know, to, um, you know, the rhetorical posturing, you know, because we're supposed to be in this partisan arena where, you know, I just can't support your bill because, you know, you're the other party and, and uh, you know, uh, I just can't be on the record, you know, saying, uh, you know, I support your bill, especially right now at this time, you know. Um, and, you know, I mean, I get it. I've been here a while and, you know, you're going to hear that. Um, but I, but I do have to respond uh, to Representative Johnson's uh, uh, comments, uh, and quite frankly, I, I take really strong offense uh, to the characterization uh, that uh, this bill uh, is anti-law enforcement. Uh, it is ludicrous on its surface. Just look at the bill and read the bill. If if this bill is anti-law enforcement. Uh, if the chair who's traffic copped it, if you will, uh, the bill therefore is anti-law enforcement, then why does the bill make the investments that it makes uh, in law enforcement? Um, I don't know about anybody else, but in my world, if I don't like something, I'm not going to spend money on it. You know, I'm not going to spend my energy on it. Uh, but that is uh, what we do uh, with this bill. Um, you know, I'll remind you, you know, there's $6 million more on the table right now, just in one area in training, which our sheriffs and chiefs badly want and constantly lobby me and everyone else here, and appropriately so. Six million more than what the other body is putting on the table. I don't hear anyone saying the other body's bill is anti-law enforcement. Why is that? We're indexing, you know, those training dollars. Who does that? Someone who cares about it or someone who doesn't care about that investment uh, in uh, training our peace officers? But we create a body camera program that the chiefs and the sheriffs have asked us to do, that the working group, uh, that the Department of Public Safety and the Attorney General's working group recommends that we ought, we, we ought to do. We put serious money into that. And not only that, but we do everything we can to make sure that those funds get out to those communities that are small communities that wrestle with resources, those small uh, police departments, those incredibly stretched out uh, sheriff's departments. I mean, we, we, we held a whole week of hearings you know, from greater Minnesota, um, uh, uh, law enforcement, peace officer, public safety uh, issues. Um, we had, you know, the sheriff from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Wadena who, who told us, look, you know, here are my real challenges, you know, with a big geographic mass um, and, um, you know, limited tax base and, you know, small number of, uh, of people. And uh, we listen carefully to that and respectfully. And we made investments to respond to that reality. That is about as far away from being law enforcement as you can get, unless you have all another definition of what that is. Uh, we actually raised the salaries of management folks in our state, um, you know, our state uh, uh, public safety uh, systems. Uh, we reinforced the Pulse Board so that it could be that quality uh, driving you know, entity that, you know, we deserve. Um, and then on top of that, <clears throat> we put a lot of investments into community resources so that regular citizens can be part of making sure that our communities are safe. And yeah, there's reforms in here. Uh, they're all incredibly reasonable. They're incredible, and yet they're incredibly meaningful. Many of them are based on uh, best practices. Um, you know, whether it's the no-knock warrant um, uh, issue, you know, it's one of the most dangerous things uh, for everyone involved. You know, the odds of a peace officer getting shot during a no-knock warrant is pretty high. Um, 
And so, uh, and obviously those who are inside are very high. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've put some really smart curbs around that issue. Is that being law enforcement? Because we, we value the lives of everyone that would be involved in that kind of, uh, of activity. Um, you know, we have language that says that public assembly, which is our first amendment, not our second or third or last, it's our first amendment, uh, you know, right. You know, that public assembly uh, uh, policies should, should be at the level of, of, of what they merit, which is a constitutional right uh, that we have uh, ingrained uh, into our laws and into our hearts. Uh, this nation. And we want to make sure that we do need crowd control. Absolutely. We want to make sure that when that is needed, that First Amendment rights are not being uh, violated. Um, I, I'm not going to go on and on. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, um, you know, frankly, you know, uh, if you want bad uh, policing, um, you know, then uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't invest the way we're investing. Uh, you shouldn't reform the way we're reforming. But I don't think anybody here wants that. I think what we want is good communities. We want good professionals. We want good relationships. We want trust because without trust, you know, we're all on our own, and that doesn't work out well for anybody. This bill is about building trust among all Minnesotans. There is nothing anti-law enforcement uh, about that. And so, you know, um, I, I just really have to push back uh, on it. I, I've just put way too much time and energy um, uh, regularly uh, talking with our, our sheriffs, our chiefs, you know, our rank and file people, as well as being out on the streets with everyday people. Uh, to uh, have a bill that I, my name is on, be characterized as anti-law enforcement. We can disagree on the policy. That's what we do here. Yeah, let's do that. But let's not go there, you know? Um, and it's not just my heart that's being broken by that, you know? Uh, when the people hear that, you know, this is dangerous language. When the people hear that, you know, then they give up. You know, the legislators are passing anti-law enforcement. Then they give up. That's not what we want. Let's be bigger than that. So I do urge a strong support of um, safety and rights of all Minnesotans. So those things absolutely need to go together. That's who we are as Minnesotans and as Americans. You know, our safety and our rights. Um, I urge you to support our community-based initiatives that are about advancing public safety, doing the hard work of preventing and intervening um, uh, on crime, with supporting our law enforcement systems based on accountability and professionalism, but supporting them, um, and supporting our corrections professionals who are keeping residents in our facilities safe and advancing rehabilitation and redemption and reentry. Uh, into productive citizenry. It is amazing work that's happening uh, in our state. Um, I ask you to support uh, the prison reform uh, that's in this bill. We didn't get a chance to talk about uh, the visionary work the Department of Corrections is folding out. Um, I want you to uh, support, you know, real meaningful steps towards sexual conduct reform, uh, reforming those statutes and the way you investigate and approach uh, all that work. Uh, I want you to stand with our firefighters. I want you to stand with our emergency uh, responders. Um, there's just so much important vital work here. Uh, like I said, we can disagree uh, on policies. You know, bring the amendments. You know, uh, let's let's talk about those amendments. Um, but let's not not support public safety. Uh, and corrections uh, in our state. Uh, so with that, uh, um, Madam Chair and members, um, you know, it truly is a, pro a privilege to carry this bill and, and to engage with you in making it better 
And uh, I look forward uh, to doing that uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, I sure do hope uh, uh, this committee has the wisdom to pass this bill forward uh, to the floor. You're, you're muted, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Mariani. Thank you for that and thank you for your bill. Uh, so members, we will now have a series of motions and votes to merge these three bills and send them to the general register using House File 1078 as the vehicle. Chair Pulowski, do you move that the language contained in House File 38 be incorporated into the public safety and judiciary omnibus as a separate article? Yes, Madam Chair, that's my motion. Okay, the motion is before us and this will be a voice vote. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, the motion prevails. Chair Becker Finn, do you move that the language of House File 1030 as amended being incorporated into the public safety and judiciary omnibus as a separate article. Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. The motion is before us. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails. Chair Mariani, do you move that the language of House File 1078 as amended be incorporated into the public safety and judiciary omnibus as separate articles. Now, Chair, it sounds like a marriage ritual, and I suppose <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, it is type of a marriage. <laughs> I do so, Boo. The motion is before us. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. So with that, Chair Mariani renews his motion the House File 1078 as amended be recommended for placement on the general register and that nonpartisan staff be directed to make any technical corrections and amend the title. This will be a roll call vote. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo. No. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright, excused. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund, excused. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan. Hassan, aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hertos. Hertos, no. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson. No. Johnson, no. Representative Cresha. No. Cresha, no. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly. Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Mariani. Aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt. Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Representative Nash. Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson, excused. Representative Noor. No, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill. Representative O'Neill. <laughs> Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative O'Neill, no. Uh, O'Neill, no. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, no. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz. Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott. No. Scott, no. 
Representative Sundin. Pass. Sundin, pass. Madam Chair, before we close the roll, Representative O'Neill's hand was up. Representative O'Neill. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I was at, uh, at something really quick for my district. Um, I just um, I just wanted to thank uh, the chair, uh, Mariani, for the work. And I apologize, I didn't get to say this earlier, so I'm just going to say it really quickly now. I was uh, um, at another event. Um, so you had put in the Alternatives to Incarceration program, and I'm really happy that you did that. And also your support for the rewrite of criminal sexual conduct statutes, which was the House Bill 707. And I just wanted to say on the record, too, that there's been so much interest in that particular bill that we've gotten we're now onto the third clone and almost i think we're at least 20 in the third so that's 35 35 plus 20 authors on that bill so i'm um, really excited to see that move forward and thank you madam chair i'm so sorry to say this after the fact i i just had to step away from something in my district thank you madam chair all right <clears throat> so let's close the roll miss Foxman, you have the count 16 eyes and nine nays so there have been 16 ayes and nine nays. The motion prevails. House file 1078 as amended is recommended for placement on the general register. And nonpartisan staff are directed to make any technical corrections and amend the title. I want to thank you all uh, of our chairs for your hard and dedicated work. So we're going to move on to House file 2230, which is the Health and Human Service Omnibus. Member. This is our last budget bill to assemble in the Health and Human Service Omnibus, which will include three different budget proposals. We have Chair Schultz, who is the Health and Human Service Bill, House File 2127. We have Chair Leavling's uh, Health Bill, House File 2128, and Articles 1, 2, 3, and 6 of Chair Pinto's Early Childhood um, budget bill, which is House File 2230, which we heard yesterday. Chair Schultz, so, 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 I can't say your name, Jen. Chair Schultz and Chair Liebling have assembled their bills under a combined budget target. So this omnibus will use Chair Liebling House File 2128 as the vehicle at the request of nonpartisan staff, we are using a delete all amendment that merges these bills to ensure the appropriation articles is correctly drafted. The DE2 amendment to House File 2128 that was provided to members reflects the language of all three bills as they came out of their committee, along with any technical corrections made by nonpartisan staff. We do also have a combined spreadsheet from Mr. Burge who were, where the provisions are color coded by committee. We will proceed directly to House File 2128 and let all three of our chairs discuss their portions of the bill once the amendment is before us. So Chair Liebling, I'm going to let you direct the presentation, but first, um, would you like to move House File 2128 as well as the DE2 amendment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move House File 2128 uh, to be recommended to be re-referred to uh, the floor. And then I would like to move the DE2 amendment. All right. So you can start off um, with your presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. We also have an author's amendment, the A15. And I think that um, because the A15 um, actually eliminates some provisions that uh, members might like to know about, and um, it, it does a lot of things, but could I move that right Do now? Move Madam that now? Chair? Yes. All right, so move. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, members, as with all omnibus bills, there are a number of things that are. Um, corrected and uh, in the author's amendment. And it's uh, uh, got a lot of pages to it, but um, I just want to kind of give you the highlights of the author's amendment 
um, before we go into more of the detail on the bill. So, and I'm going to just talk about the pieces in the author's amendment that pertain to my sections, and then Representative Schultz, Chair Schultz, will talk about the ones that pertain to her. And I, there, I don't know if there are things that pertain to Chair Pinto. He may want to discuss that as well. First of all, the very first thing in the author's amendment is um, some uh, language that um, aligns us with the Senate with regard to um, dispensing fees for prescription drugs under medical assistance. Uh, Representative Grunhagen in our committee was quite adamant. He wanted to uh, raise the rate even further than it is in our original bill. And so we are accommodating that and aligning with the Senate. Secondly, I wanted to point this out to members. We've removed a provision that took savings from a change in the way we pay for durable medical equipment. I just want to point that out because I know that provision was causing a lot of heartburn for certain folks. That will now be out of the bill. Um, there's a provision from House File 57 that had been heard in our committee that had been left out because we um, had a cost, but was worked out to not have a cost. Um, so that is in the bill. Um, there are some technical changes. There is um, under the prescription drug article, Article 5, um, we have removed CGIP from a provision in the bill because we realize that um, the bill, this has to do with uh, prescription drug formulary transparency. And we came to realize that because CGIP, which for people watching might not know that acronym, that's our um, public employee um, health insurance system um, for Minnesota, and that, um, that the provisions really don't apply to CGIP anyway because it's managed in a different way. Um, by the same token, there's another provision that was a bill from Representative Bonner, 2114, that is being deleted here because um, it does unfortunately have a cost. And so we're taking that out of the bill, it has an unexpected cost. Um, telehealth is a pretty important part of this bill. I know a number of people watching are very <laughs> interested in the telehealth provisions. Um, we've done some uh, just technical changes here, but importantly, we, if we had intended the sunset in the bill to apply to changes that are being made in private plans as well as our public programs. So we are reflecting that in the amendment. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment when I run through the actual bill. Uh, but that covers, oh, and then there are some changes in the appropriations that impact my part of the bill as well. And that is, um, we are uh, in the bill, we are providing additional funding uh, for our public health infrastructure, something we're very proud of. Um, we're putting rider language to make sure that that money is to supplement and not supplant local funds for public health. And um, we are also increasing, uh, because we um, moved some money around a little bit as we got uh, fiscal notes and got more specific um, fiscal estimates, we're able to put some additional money into the public health response contingency account. So I will turn it over to Representative Schultz to talk about her portions just of this author's amendment, the A-15. Uh, to Chair Schultz. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Moran and Chair Liebling. So in the um, author's amendment, there are four provisions under human services. The first is just a correction to a drafting mistake from the revisor's office relating to House File 1943, which is Chair Pinto's bill. The second is language to fix the customized living um, reimbursement rate for um, housing with service facilities. Um, the third is updated language for collective bargaining negotiations over the PCA contracts. And the last one is language to give um, direction to DHS when working on billing corrections with tribes. And those are the, the four um, provisions in the author's amendment under human services. So Madam Chair, I don't know if uh, Chair Pinto uh, had anything okay. in this that he would want to mention. Okay, um, Chair Pinto. Pinto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't believe that there is anything in this amendment that relates to the early childhood uh, area. 
Okay, so uh, Chair Liebman, is that your complete overview of the DE2 amendments? It is, Madam Chair. Okay, so Madam Chair, mm -hmm. the, the A15 amendment. Oh, yep. Yes. So, so oh, what we you. need, so what we need to do now is um, we need to move the the A15. So uh, there's a question from Representative Schumacher. Okay. For okay. Okay. So. Um, and, and I, I don't know, so I'm going to ask uh, Chair Liebman, did you explain the A15 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, that's what we, we just did a pretty quick run through, but be happy to take questions on it because there are a number of different things in it. Okay, uh, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Chair Liebman and Chair Schultz for uh, this amendment here. Just a couple of questions. First, uh, Chair Liebman, I, wanted, I really did want to thank you for uh, deleting sections 49 and 50 from the bill um, that piece on page four with the durable medical equipment. I very much appreciate that. I was one who had heartburn on that and um, mm -hmm. really am glad to see that um, you were able to find a solution to fix that piece. Um, I did have a question on the, the CEGA portion of it. Um, you said that the provisions really didn't apply um, because they're not managed in the same way. I know that the, the bill that this was taken from um, had a much bigger discussion on that in the state government committee. And since I've been on the state government committee, I don't really understand. Could you help me understand that piece of it and how it's not managed the same way? Chair sure, Liebling. Yeah, I will. Thank you, Representative Schumacher. So um, first of all, there are two different bills that we uh, need to make sure we're clear. So there is a bill from Representative Bonner that had to do with um, trying to um, control what consumers had to pay for a pharmaceutical at the point of sale. And it referred to the net price of the drug. And this is one that turned out it had a lot of cost. And we're just taking that provision out of the bill. So that would have impacted CGIP as well, but we're just taking it out, period. So um, the one that I was discussing that we took out, the portion from... Um, for CGIP was an Elkins bill, and this has to do with mid-year formulary changes. And the reason that we took out CGIP is what we believe that CGIP, uh, well, first of all, we clarified and found out that when people um, get a CGIP plan, when an employee gets this um, employer plan, which is what CGIP is, that you don't pick your plan based on the formulary. Everybody has the same formulary. So that's fundamentally different than what happens in the private market where you go and shop for a plan. And the problem that this bill is trying to solve in this area is the problem of some consumers will choose their plan based on what drugs are covered in the formulary. And that consumer buys a plan, say they buy it on Minsure or they buy it through a broker, they are locked into that plan for a year. But the insurance company can change the formulary at any time. And so oftentimes you'll have a consumer who's getting a certain drug and suddenly that drug is no longer covered or covered at a different cost for them. And so there's um, a fundamental unfairness there where a person is buying a plan and expecting to get a certain thing and they're picking the plan for that reason. And then they're locked in, but the insurance company is not. That is fundamentally different than what's going on in CGIP, where everybody's getting the same plan. You are not picking a plan based on your need for a certain drug. Everyone who's in CGIP is in the same boat. So that's why um, we felt that it is a principal distinction to say that we're not going to cover CGIP with this requirement because consumers are not being deprived of the benefit of their bargain under CGIP, but they are in the private market. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps Representative Schumacher. Representative Schumacher. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Weebling. Yes, that does uh, make more sense uh, after you've explained it that way. Um, that did uh, seem to work out. So uh, with that, you had the, the bill in there. There, When the bill was originally in front of us in committee before, and this language um, was in there with the, without CGIP being excluded, is that where the, the cost on the fiscal notes for the, the Elkins bill um, were those part of the budget then originally? And if so, does getting rid of the CGIP uh, piece of that, does that open up funds or how did that work? 
Um, Chair Liebling. Madam Chair and Representative Schumacher, no, I think we didn't have the bill. We just didn't include the bill at that time because it did carry a lot of cost and we were trying to figure out how to do that. And so we're putting that piece back in the, without CGIP is what's happening in this amendment. So that piece, which as you might recall, is really important. The uh, Minnesota Medical Association was particularly interested in this piece. And initially we weren't, uh, we weren't able to do it and we're, oh no, I'm sorry, wait a minute. I might be mixing that up with a different provision. Um, in any event, we did not, um, we never did include those costs in our bill. And I think we just left it out, as I said, and that this is what is going back in now. Okay. And if staff will correct me if I got that backwards, hopefully. Okay. Representative Schumacher. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Chair Liebling, for that understanding. I appreciate that. Uh, my last question for this amendment is for Chair Schultz. Um, and it deals with the portion that's on page nine, uh, lines 929 through 9.31. Um, just wondering where that date came from for the integrated community supports for that deadline for next year. Chair Schultz. I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, Representative Schumacher? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Chair Walker, please go forth. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Schultz. Uh, on page nine, uh, lines nine point two nine through nine point three one, this is the um, integrated health sections. Um, just wondering on the deadline for that, the April first, twenty twenty one. That's on our screen now. Um, how did that come to, and uh, what impact do we expect to have from the the integrated services? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Chair Moran and uh, Representative Schumacher. So this is language we've been working on to make sure that certain housing with services does not need to apply for assisted living licensure and they can continue customized living. So this is language that allows them to continue customized living. Now DHS is moving forward with something called integrated community supports to make sure that we're following federal guidelines. Um, so under they're moving towards this new system. So this is why they put a date for new facilities um, going forward to um, um, capture providers under this new system. Representative Schumacher. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Schultz, for that. Um, I have talked to uh, Touchstone Mental Health and Clear Housing, two of the organizations that provide. Uh, care for homeless folks that also have HIV or other disabilities with this. And they have some concerns with that uh, April 1st deadline there. Is that something that can continue to be worked on for that? Or is that kind of a hard and fast deadline that you're proposing here? Representative Schultz, Chair Schultz. Thank you, Chair Moran and Representative Schumacher. We continue to work with um, Claire and Touchstone to um, listen to their concerns. Uh, this is an amendment that we initially created um, in my committee on the last Friday of our committee hearings. And we're, we continue to work with DHS and the providers on language. So I, I think that moving forward, we're gonna continue to work with providers um, and try to accommodate their concerns when it moves to conference committee or the floor. Representative Schumacher. Okay, that concludes my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Is there any other questions or comments to the A15 amendment? If not, Chair Liebling's renew her motion to adopt the A15 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay. Um, is there any, well, we have another amendment. We have the A16 amendment that I believe Representative Schultz is um, moving. Uh, Representative, I'm sorry, Chair Schultz, would you like to move the A16 amendment? I would like to move the A16 amendment, Chair Moran. Can you please just explain it? Thank you, Chair Moran. The A16 amendment um, provides language to address um, 
uh, mistake in the human services omnibus bill um, to correct language to make sure it aligns with our spreadsheet and it's around the, the PCA framework language. Okay. Are there any questions to the A16 amendment? All right. There being none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, so there, are there any further questions to the DE2 amendment as amended? Madam Chair? Yes, Chair Liebling. All right, Madam Chair, I know we, we spent uh, some time on the uh, author's amendment, but we haven't really described the bill yet. And so okay. I, I wonder if we could just, uh, this is, um, especially with the three bills together, this is a very large bill. And uh, in my uh, unbiased opinion here, it's really a terrific bill. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to um, actually, you uh, explained in your introduction that uh, about combining these three bills. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to ask uh, Chair Schultz to go first to describe her portions of the bill. And then I'd like to just very uh, briefly in kind of a summary way, talk about what is in the bill because there, there are uh, many really wonderful provisions. And we just, uh, I, know, I know time is short, but we'd love to have just a few minutes to run through it. You have time, Chair Schultz. Thank you, Chair Moran, and thank you, Chair Liebling. So this is one of the best health and human services omnibus finance bills I've seen in my time in the legislature. Okay. Um, we have a joint budget target of 346.5 million and a tails target of 299.2 million. That does, does not include uh, Chair Pinto's provisions in early childhood. So this is just the health and the human services uh, jurisdiction. Um, I also want to thank all of the staff that have been working so hard on these uh, big, big bills. Um, and I won't name everybody here, but I want to thank our staff and nonpartisan staff and fiscal staff. So if, Chris, if uh, Mr. McCall could share a document that will help um, me, I am just going to highlight a few of the budget provisions in the human services uh, omnibus. And I'm not going to talk about every single thing. We'll be here all night if I did. I wish I could. Mm -hmm. But I broke it down into six sections. One is I have, there's two divisions reporting to human services. One is preventing homelessness chaired by Chair Gomez. And the second is behavioral health chaired by uh, Representative Fisher. And so these six uh, areas, I broke the down, down, them down into one is preventing homelessness. The second is economic assistance. The third is caregiving our home and community-based services, HCBS. The fourth is behavioral health. The next one is substance abuse reforms or SUD, substance use disorder reforms. Um, and the last category is child welfare and protections. So the first piece, and then I've got it listed just the biennium budget and not the tails. But all of this information is in the budget tracking sheet that Doug Berg has um, been working on. So in the first uh, part of preventing homelessness, we're dedicating 25 million. And this is based on representatives Hassan, Howard, and Cagle's bills. Um, 5 million goes for emergency shelters, 18 million for emergency service grants, and 2 million in housing and support service grants. The bill also includes language for reports regarding projects funded under the Long-Term Homelessness Supportive Services Program. The second area under preventing homelessness are, is House File 780. This is Representative Ryer's bill. It expands um, beds that um, serve individuals who are experiencing uh, mental health or substance abuse or HIV AIDS. And this expands from the counties currently being offered these beds, which I think are there's 226 beds currently. This expands to 500 beds. Currently, Anoka, Dakota, Hennepin, and Ramsey County, this bill includes additional counties of Carver, Scott, and Washington counties. The second area is economic assistance. And the first uh, bill of note is the cost of living adjustment for the Minnesota Family Investment Program. This program um, helps low-income families get out of deep poverty. And deep poverty for a family of three is only $905 a month. The current MFIP cash benefit is $632 for a family of three, meaning this benefit level is below deep poverty. We've only increased MFIP once in the last 35 years. That happened in 2019. So this bill includes a COLA adjustment, and it uses the Consumer Price Index. 
Also in 2021, there's a one-time MFIP increase of $700, and that's a $25 million expense. The second provision under economic assistance is the economic assistance program uniformity provision. And this reduces the administrative burden on the applicants, participants, and on counties. So for example, MFIP costs about $128 per case per month to administer. This um, replaces uh, monthly reporting to six month reporting and reduces uh, paperwork burden. The third provision under economic assistance is the SNAP. This is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It increases the federal poverty guidelines from 165% to 200%. And this follows along. Um, many other states have also increased the, this provision. And the cost is very small because most of it's covered by federal funds. The next category is caregiving and home and community-based services. This is the uh, personal care attendant increase. One is in the SEIU contract. This increases wages from 1325 to 1440, starting October, 2021. And then um, the wage floor from 1440 to 1525, starting in July, 2022. There's also a rate framework increase. This is Representative Lippard's bill, House File 663. This um, increases uh, rates and it has a cost of 8.3 million in the biennium and um, close to 40 million in the tails. But as, you, as most people know, we've been working on PCA rate reform for a long time. We see um, a huge shortage of PCAs across the state. Um, and so we're trying to address that workforce shortage and the historically low wages. Um, for PCAs and they do very important work, particularly we see this during the pandemic. So we have more work to do in this area, but this is a, a good beginning. Um, under the PCAs, we're also uh, funding Representative Acom's bill, House File 1159. This extends um, um, reimbursement for spouses and parents to provide PCA services. And this expired um, in early February and this extends that until um, the new rate framework is initiated. Uh, the last piece under caregiving and home and community-based services is the waiver reimagine. Uh, waivers, these waivers help to help people with disabilities remain active in their communities and also to be to stay healthy and safe and independent as much as possible. So this simplifies um, um, the waiver system and it reduces inconsistent inconsistencies across counties. The next category under, is under behavioral health. Chair Fisher, uh, along with um, Representative Frankie, and in a bipartisan way with all of their committee members, worked to address um, many issues. They heard House File 970 under mental health. This is Representative Vang's bill. And what this bill does is to um, address the workforce shortage in mental health by making alcohol and drug counselors eligible for an existing loan forgiveness program, um, allowing DHS children's mental health grants to be used to provide supervision to clinical trainees from BIPOC communities, establishing a culturally informed and responsive mental health task force, and increasing diversity on licensing boards. The next bill under behavioral health is um, funding um, to add to the adult mental health initiative grants. This was being led by Representative Ryer and House File 1600. And last under behavioral health is the mental health uniform service standards, trying to standardize um, um, paperwork and making it easier for mental health, um, uh, mental health professionals to do a, their job and provide high quality care. Under um, substance abuse reforms, this is a lot of significant work was done by Chair Fisher and his division um, to reform substance abuse and improve outcomes and quality. The first one um, was funding recovery community organization grants. This was Representative Jordan, House File 2084. These organizations provide mentorship and ongoing support to individuals dealing with substance abuse disorders and connecting them with resources. The second one is a provision brought forward by Representative Thompson, House File 722. Um, this includes a 5% rate increase for substance abuse disorder treatment services provided by culturally specific or culturally responsive programs or disability responsive programs. Um, a rate increase um, also directs DHS in, cons in consultation with said 
said treatment providers, lead agencies, and individuals who receive treatment to develop a statewide implementation and transition plan for culturally and linguistically appropriate services um, that, have na that are national standards. And also this item includes spending uh, for grants to said treatment providers to implement culturally and linguistically appropriate service standards. The SUD paperwork um, initiative, um, this is brought forward by Representative Frederick, House File 2116, to minimize regulatory paperwork for SUD providers. And then Chair Fisher, the SUD reform uh, initiative was to um, improve enhanced rates to SUD uh, treatment programs, to get more programs enrolled in a demonstration project, and to improve outcomes and quality. And lastly, under this uh, category is uh, Edelson, Representative Edelson, Edelson's bill, House File 287. This is the Sober Home Oversight Study. Um, this is a study of looking at the functioning and outcomes for sober homes across the state. The next area is under child welfare and protections. Uh, House File 944 was worked on by Representative Hansen. Uh, this is a significant and very important legislation. Um, currently, if um, individuals or families who are on medical assistance, if their children need intensive mental health services, many would have to go into the child protection system to take advantage of title, federal Title IV-E dollars. This corrects that problem to keep children out of the child protective system and allows them to get those mental health services without having to go into that child protective system. The second one is the family first implementation provision. Representative Noor worked on this language. It was also in the governor's budget. It allows states to leverage federal funding to provide services to families for children who are at risk of out of home placement. So to reduce out of home placement and keep children and their families in a safe environment in a safe way. The next provision is Chair Pinto's House File 1943. This creates the new child protection non-caregiver sex trafficking assessment track. Um, there's also a provision by Chair Pinto in House File 947, Section 6, and that raises the age of delinquency from 10 to 13. The next one is House File 390. This is Chair Becker Finn's parent support grants. It appropriates funding for grants to an organization to provide mentoring, guidance, and support services to parents navigating the child welfare system in Minnesota. The next one is from the governor's budget. The governor's proposal invests in the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, training and development for county child welfare and child protective staff. Um, and the, I'm sorry, and the parent support grants, I believe uh, Chair Moran also worked on that provision. Um, the next one under um, uh, the miscellaneous category are the repayments to the tribal and county repayments for overpayments under um, um, IMDs. Um, the next miscellaneous item uh, is funding for the essential workers, the Emergency Leave Act, which was uh, Representative Frazier's bill, House File 41. This covers uh, uh, staff in employed in nursing facilities. And the last one are making some COVID changes permanent. And this was sponsored by Representative Wogelmott. So that is just a summary of the budget bills. I am not gonna go through all of the policy provisions, but I encourage you to look through the omnibus bill and would we'll stand for questions after um, the summary of the rest of the bill. Okay, uh, Chair Liebling. Um, all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so um, I'll, uh, I don't have a, a visual aid today, but uh, just will talk through um, in pretty general terms, some of the provisions in the health portion of the bill. Um, and, uh, and I will say too, that at the end of this, um, and after Chair Pinto gets done, I know that our fiscal staff, uh, Mr. Berg has prepared sort of a summary sheet. Um, we're not gonna ask him to walk through the spreadsheet um, as some of the other bills have done, because we'd probably be here till tomorrow. It's a, I think it's a 26 page spreadsheet in the tiny little type in which these things are done. So we don't want him to walk through, but I think what he, we will do is put up his summary sheet and, and, and uh, perhaps ask him to explain that. But so the health portion of, uh, of the bill, 
um, does a number of very important things. The first thing is it really works to build a better healthcare system, and in particular, a better public health system, which uh, the COVID pandemic has really shown a spotlight on the holes in our public health uh, safety net. And so first of all, we have in the bill um, a provision from Representative Kelly Morrison and Representative Jay Zhang, House File 2113, that is about vaccine equity. And um, we've, we've um, also put some money in that bill so that it's not only about now, it's about building a better system to reach underserved populations in the future as well. And we've put $10 million uh, for the biennium per biennium, excuse me, into that. Uh, because uh, as I said, it's very important that we now, we now understand the importance of public health to our state and to its whole economy. Um, we also are uh, building that public health infrastructure through some investments in local public health. Um, also $10 million a biennium, this is a Wolgamont bill. And we're putting some money into refreshing the public health contingency account, which has been depleted in the pandemic. Um, probably we'll need to do more with that um, in coming years, but we, we've taken a start on that. Um, there are a number of provisions um, that are kind of the off-ramp for waivers that have been put in place by the Department of Human Services uh, during the pandemic that we're funding. Um, we also have some studies in the bill to think about how we deliver public health programs in the future and how to establish a public health insurance option that will make health insurance more affordable over the long term. And that is a Schultz bill. Um, we are putting Affordable Care Act provisions into state statute to make sure that they don't go away. Um, important things that uh, everybody has come to really rely on, such as not losing your, uh, not being charged higher rates when you have pre-existing conditions or not being denied insurance. So those things uh, would go into Minnesota law in this bill. And finally, uh, under this category, Representative Morrison worked hard on telehealth. I mentioned this a little bit during our discussion of the, um, of the amendment, of the author's amendment, but um, what we're doing on telehealth um, there's been a lot of interest in continuing the expansion that happened during the pandemic. So as many of you know, during the pandemic, um, people have been able to have a lot more visits over um, audiovisual, like we're doing right now over Zoom or even over the phone. And it's been uh, a very important experiment, if you will. But it turns out that keeping this as wide open as we have it is also very expensive, or at least the fiscal note is high. So we're taking sort of a middle ground approach. We are kind of keeping a lot of these provisions in law uh, with a sunset and with a study that will come back and tell us, kind of uh, allow us to look at this a little more fine tune in two years in the next budget cycle. So that is what is going on with telehealth in this bill. Um, other than that, there's a lot in this bill that improves health and well-being for kids and their families and addresses health disparities. Um, importantly, we are expanding postpartum coverage for, for people who give birth on medical assistance from 60 days to six months. Uh, we would have liked to go for a year. Um, but the cost was prohibitive on that. But we do understand that this is very important to the health and well-being of new moms to have this continued coverage. We are covering um, under medical assistance right now. Um, a lot of different things are covered. A lot of medications are covered. But medical assistance right now excludes coverage for weight loss drugs. This is a Connie Bernardi, Representative Bernardi provision. And it turns out that this is a real gap in our coverage. Um, and it often impacts teenagers and it often impacts teenagers of color. And being obese is a really, uh, has a lot of very bad impacts on a person's overall health. And there are now drugs that can be very useful in this effort. So that is being covered under this bill. Better asthma management for kids with very bad asthma. Again, uh, often these are kids of color, 
this is a, a very important improvement for health. Um, expanding integrated perinatal care for high-risk women, another equity provision, because we know we have terrible disparities in the health of new moms and their babies. Um, we have uh, Representative Richardson's Dignity in Pregnancy and Childbirth Bill, which is one of the another, I should say, uh, recommendation from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. We have increased funding for lead risk assessments, which is coming from Representative Lee. Uh, we fixed the family foster background studies to align with adoption standards. This was Representative Moran's uh, really uh, important bill that she carried in the past. Representative Hollins is carrying it now. And um, I am just so grateful for that because I think this will make such a difference for children who are um, unfortunately need to be removed from their homes to make it much more possible for them to stay with their kin when that happens. Um, we have the uh, skin lightening cream bill from uh, Representative Hassan to uh, continue working on this very important public health issue. And we have a small grant for an organization that tries to address gun trauma, which is a very compelling presentation that we heard in our committee about the trauma, both of people who end up using a gun and those who end up on the receiving end of the gun and how this traumatizes communities. Very timely, I would say. Um, we have provisions in the bill to improve dental care in our public health programs. And I know this is of great interest to many members. We have Representative Bierman's bill to increase or to, to continue covering, to once again cover periodontal care. This was uh, carved out to save money some years ago when we had a budget deficit. And it it is just uh, not covering that service means that people really don't get the care that they really need to keep themselves healthy, to keep them healthy. Um, we have uh, a plan that Representative Ryer has been working on, also from the governor's budget, that's a little bit still in progress, but we're getting much closer, and that is to have a single dental administrator for all our public programs, have a dental home concept to actually improve dental coverage, dental care for people on medical assistance, and also to provide higher rates for dentists who see our public program patients. And I know members, many members on both sides of the aisle have wanted to do this for years. We are finally able to do that in this bill. We've got maybe a couple tweaks that are still being worked out just on the finances, but it is within the appropriation that is in the bill. And finally, on that piece, I mentioned that the uh, durable medical equipment savings have been removed in the author's amendment. Um, and I know Representative Schumacher mentioned he's happy to see that be out. Um, we have a number of provisions on prescription drugs, which we know continues to be a very important issue for Minnesotans who struggle often to be able to afford essential drugs that they need to stay healthy, sometimes to save their very lives. And um, so we have the, a bill in here from Representative Stevenson that prohibits prescription drug price gouging. We have um, a bill that continues the coverage for contraceptives that we now have under the Affordable Care Act, but puts that into Minnesota law and uh, improves coverage for contraceptives for Minnesota women, almost all of whom use contraceptives at some point in their lives. We are eliminating co-pays for HIV drugs in, in this bill. Um, there were more provisions that were brought to us that we unfortunately weren't able to do in the HIV space, but eliminating co-pays is a very important measure that will help reduce the incidence of HIV in our state. Um, very important public health measure. Um, we extend uh, under public programs. We allow certain drugs to be refilled for 90 days instead of only 30, and this is a cost saver. Um, we have a very important provision that I have carried um, and has been in the governor's uh, bill also about getting the, um, getting the PBMs out of our public health care programs. And um, there's been some uh, work done on that to uh, you know, try to reduce some of the opposition from some 
um, entities that feel that they'll be losing some hidden, what I would call hidden subsidies that they've been getting through our Medicaid program um, that they would lose in this. And so we're keeping them whole with some additional funding in the bill. Um, as I mentioned, we are increasing reimbursement to dent to a pharmacist who um, under our bill who are, uh, and this is a provision, Representative Grunhagen talked about this in our committee, um, an attempt to try to help independent pharmacists. We recognize that many are struggling around the state and we want to try to um, help them stay afloat as much as we can. Oftentimes they provide a lot of the health care in a small community. Um, as I mentioned also with the authors of the A-12 amendment, we're prohibiting insurance plans from making mid-year formulary changes. And um, we are also including an important bill from Representative Bierman, House File 633, that requires insurance carriers to offer some plans with flat dollar co-pays for drugs. And this is for folks who have chronic conditions who know they're going to have to pay a lot for drugs. And it just simply means they won't have to pay it all out of pocket in the very first month of the year to meet their out of pocket cap or um, to meet their deductible. Um, finally, um, and of course there's much more in there. I know it gets, this is, it takes a long time even to just list these items, but um, there are more in there and I hope members will, will read the bill and, uh, and see all the great things that are in there. I just wanna mention one other category and that is, um, we have funding in the bill or um, changing the funding, I should say, for Hennepin County um, uh, Hospital to um, be able to take advantage of a new funding stream under uh, federal, federal money coming in. And uh, they very much need this to uh, stay afloat. And that's a provision that I'm carrying. We do have an exception to the hospital bed moratorium for Regents Hospital to allow them to add 45 new beds, um, including uh, 20 mental health beds. And we have some important improvements to the bed moratorium law that come from Representative Fisher and Representative Lippert. And I won't go into detail on that, except to say that I believe that this will help us um, have more mental health inpatient beds available because we do need them in this state. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. That is a lot. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time and I've just totally skimmed the surface here, but it is a really a good bill. We're very proud of it. I do, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Berg, well, I think that probably Chair, Chair um, Pinto is going to want to say a few words, but um, I do just want to really give my appreciation to all of the members on uh, both committees that uh, we worked on this. Um, I also sat on Representative Schultz's committee and she sat on mine and many of the same members on both committees. And um, everyone worked very hard to put this together and especially my appreciation to the staff. This is a big bill. It's been an enormous effort and um, there will be more thank yous on the floor. So I'll just stop right there, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Chair Liebling. To Chair Pinto, um, is there anything that you would like to um, share with us? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And I, I had a chance to walk through the full early childhood bill yesterday, so I don't want to belabor um, that uh, today. I'll simply thank Chairs uh, Liebling and Schultz for allowing early childhood along for the ride and note um, what a close uh, connection there is between the contents of, uh, of, of their two bills and the early childhood bill in terms of getting young kids and their families, young kids off to great start supporting their families too. Chair Liebling identified a number of those provisions. Several passed through our committee, some didn't because they connected more to childbirth and pregnancy, um, but, but a ton of connection there. And then just more broadly recognizing the different ways that, uh, uh, that allowing uh, young Minnesotans to thrive and therefore all of us to do so, tie in with the goals of that broader bill. And I just want to thank um, uh, uh, one person on staff in particular, which is Doug Berg. Uh, his name was just mentioned, but he's done just incredible work supporting all three of these goals from a fiscal perspective. Many more thank yous. We'll save those for the floor as well. But I did want to give a shout out to him. And then, of course, happy to uh, discuss uh, any further questions members may, may have. But of course, we discussed the bill a fair amount yesterday, too. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Chair Pinto. So members, is there any further discussion to the bill or questions before we adopt the DE2 amendment? There being no further discussion, 
Chair Liebling renews her motion to adopt the DE2 amendments as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. The, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, is there any further discussion to the bill before we proceed to final passage? Um, Madam Chair, did you want Mr. Berg to walk through any of the, the, the little summary spreadsheet that we have? Do you think that would be helpful, Chair Liebling, or um, leave it to questions if there's no questions? Yeah, maybe we should just leave it to questions, Madam Chair. Okay, final call. <laughs> Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm just uh, happy to do the wrap up for our side when, whenever we're ready for that. We're ready, Representative Schumacher. All right, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee chairs who put this bill together. There's obviously a lot of work that goes into uh, these bills, and um, even though we're not going to agree on a lot of it or much of any of it, it's still uh, really good to to know that there is sincere work that is put into these bills. Um, as I mentioned before in the previous committee, this is one of maybe two times that I can remember that I've seen an increase in the EGHS budget uh, that we've been able to work with. And so I, we've kind of gotten used to over the years having to find savings so that we can do new things uh, throughout the budgets as well. Uh, this year though, we have that positive target. And so um, there's a lot of different opportunities that we could have taken but even with that positive target, we still have uh, budget reductions that happened in areas like for the foster care families that we have, or for the disability child care providers who are doing work remotely. We're still seeing great changes there that's going to reduce what these foster care families and disability care providers are receiving. We're seeing uh, use of one-time dollars that are going to be put into long-term spending. We're seeing that in the CCAP rates for child care providers. We've been asking for years and trying to find a bipartisan way to get CCAP funding passed, but we've always expected it to come with some reforms to the system after the OLA report that came out a few years ago showing the amount of fraud that can be found in there. So we were never able to get to the actual CCAP rate increases. Uh, we get there this time with this bill, but we're doing it with one-time money and no reforms. And we're seeing uh, inflationary increases that are given to MFIP coming from a block grant that doesn't increase with inflation. And so at some point, the state's going to be on the hook for that inflationary increase without the help of the block grant. And while we're talking about the MFIP reforms that are going on there, this bill offers cash grant recipients relief to the reporting that they have to do on income eligibility because of how cumbersome and confusing it can be. Yet at the same time, that same population under this bill would then have to keep track of a medical insurance plan, a transportation plan, a dental insurance plan, and a pharmacy benefit plan because of the car routes that we see here versus having just something that is comprehensive. And so I see a bit of a, a juxtaposition for the folks who are in the input program that in one area we're trying to save them, uh, effort that can be confusing, but at the same time, taking away some of the coordination of care that they're going to receive. In addition, this bill does spend nearly $150 million more in new money into the admin of the Department of Human Services. It allows the Department of Human Services to spend whatever it seems necessary. If the Supreme Court finds the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. And for those reasons, Madam Chair members, I will be voting no today. Thank you. Okay, um, any further discussion? Um, I'm just gonna open it up for, uh, well, let me just say this first before I pass it back over to the, um, the chairs for any closing comments. Um, and I will make this short, short too, but I do really want to thank uh, the Health and Human Service Chairs for, you know, for your leadership and for pulling together this complex but really crucial bill 
you know, as a former chair of Health and Human Service, I know the breadth of what goes through those committees and uh, and the, the time and energy uh, and information that is put in through those hearings. And you're right, uh, Chair Lee, and I'm sure you're only touching just, you know, a, a little part of what this bill really, in, in this uh, omnibus bill really entails. But I just, again, just want to thank you both for, for the work that uh, you, Chair Lee and Chair Schultz have done to bring this bill before us today in ways and means. And with that, I would just like to open it up to maybe Chair Schultz for a closing statement then, Chair Liebling. Thank you, Chair Moran. I just want to um, thank you for your past service on human services. I know you understand how much work that committee is and the important work we do. Um, I, we didn't point out, but a lot of the provisions in our bill address many of the recommendations from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. Um, so we're really proud of that work and there is more work to do um, and we've just started. So we're looking forward to continuing to do that work. Um, I will also say that um, this is a, we did have a positive budget target and I wanna thank Speaker Hortman for giving us uh, revenue to spend in these areas. In my area of human services, we tried to allocate money to those who are most in need and most vulnerable in our state, and there's more work to do there. And I'm really optimistic that we'll be getting um, federal money, even though it's one time, and we will be able to use um, a lot of the federal funds for human services and public health, and we're looking forward to um, appropriating that money once we have federal guidelines. And again, I just want to, again, thank the, our committee members for all the great bills they brought forward and for the work that they've done and that they're continuing to do um, on their bills and those that are included in the omnibus. And I look forward to working with them next year on more policy language. Mm. Chair Liebling. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if a Representative Pinto wanted to respond on the issue about Supposedly, there being no reforms in the um, child care assistance program where we are putting a lot of uh, funding. It, but uh, I see he unmuted himself. So I won't go into that because I think he'll want to, uh, he should probably respond to that one. But I just do want to respond to a couple of things. Um, I didn't address this directly in my remarks, but um, members who've known me for a while know that I really believe that we need to make fundamental changes in how we deliver our public programs. Right now, 75% of the people who are in our public programs, we take up one public program and we have them essentially take, get into an insurance product. Some of them are go through our county-based uh, system, which seems to work very well. But some of them uh, have to even choose between uh, an insurance product. They become a patient of, of a, a managed care organization. And that's where we get a lot of confusion. I would argue and have argued for a long time that it's very wasteful. It's very confusing. And for us as policymakers, it's almost impossible to manage. And yet billions of dollars run through that system. So what we're doing in this bill, there are a number of things, and Representative Schumacher referred to them, um, where we are, to, we are starting to take back some of the uh, benefits that are currently delivered in this very confusing way through our managed care organizations, where we can't manage them, and where the costs are not controllable by us, and we oftentimes don't even know what we're paying for what. And so um, there, there are in this bill a, a few items like that. Now, Representative Schumacher just talked about that being confusing for recipients. I don't, this is the first time I've heard that argument. I know that there's a lot of pushback on this, probably a lot of it coming from the managed care organizations themselves who obviously don't want to lose control of this because losing control of this also probably involves losing control of a great deal of the money that comes along with providing these or managing these services. But I think that we can do a much better job in these areas. One is the prescription drug uh, formulary or a program that I've talked about here where the, the growth trend under managed care organizations under this part of our program is much steeper than it is um, for us in, in the um, fee-for-service side where we're delivering it directly. Um, we have um, the dental program, 
where we spend tons of money, but we get very, very poor results. It's time to do something different in that space. We are paying a lot of money, and yet people on those programs are not getting the dental care they deserve. We need to make fundamental change there. And then there's another one about how we give people rides to get to the doctor, which also is needs reform. So, you know, I, so I, I'm just going to, I guess, respectfully disagree with Representative Schumacher on that. The other thing that he said that I just would like to push back on briefly is the idea that because we have a target that's a plus target, and we do, this is a very good target for which I thank the speaker. It's a very important time to invest in health and human services. But having a positive target doesn't mean we should not make cuts anywhere. We should always be looking to see where are we overspending? What do we need to tweak? Where are we not getting what we're paying for? So the idea that we shouldn't make cuts anywhere is uh, really surprising to me. Of course, we should. We always should be looking to see what's working, what isn't working. And we want to always be spending money, our resources, everyone here knows, will always be limited. So we need to focus our efforts on where they can do the most good and be willing to pull back on spending in areas where it's not buying what we needed to. So with that, Madam Chair, I thank you again for giving us this time. I would encourage members to vote for this bill. I hope that Representative Pinto will say a couple of words about the Child Care Assistance Program, because I think that uh, that criticism that there is no reform on that and that is just completely off base, but that would be more for him to uh, respond to. So thank you, members, and uh, we'll really appreciate your vote for this bill. All right. Um, I, I guess you opened the door, Chair Liebling. Uh, Representative Pinto, Chair Pinto, would you like to make any okay. further ending statements? I, I, I will do, Madam Chair, and I'll do so very quickly. Um, and I will just note that, as Chair Liebling has said, uh, there, uh, the bill is, in fact, chock full of, uh, of reforms in the, in the area of early care and learning and uh, related to child care assistance program. I'm not sure if, uh, if Ali Schumacher, what he's referencing is the idea of the program integrity, which was concerned several years ago. And I just want to remind him and everyone that actually we did a ton in the budget bill two years ago um, to address many concerns in that area. And so that's less of a focus in this particular bill. What the focus in this one uh, is very much saying that, uh, that we have a system that is fragmented and, and confusing for providers and for families alike. So they're doing a lot to, to work on it. And so uh, we have uh, quite a bit, as I highlighted yesterday, in terms of looking at the governance. I'm looking at the parent aware quality metric system and how well that is working um, and, uh, and quite a bit of reform. Um, I'm not sure if there's something in particular that uh, Representative Schumacher has in mind. Um, but I will note that it probably is in the bill. <laughs> if he does have something, I'm happy to talk with him further. We can be really proud of the uh, of the proposal, and uh, would urge members to vote in support of the uh, of the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairs. <clears throat> there being no further discussion, Chair Liebling renews a motion that House File 2128, as amended, be recommended for placement on the general register, and that nonpartisan staff be directed to make any technical corrections. This will be a roll call vote. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo. Representative Garofalo. Garofalo votes no. Um, Representative Albright, excused. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund, excused. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan? Representative aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hertos? Representative Hertos. Representative Hornstein. Representative Hornstein. Representative Johnson. No. Johnson, no. Representative Kresha. No. Kresha, no. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. 
Lily, I. Representative Mariani. Mariani, I. Mariani, I. Representative Marquardt. Marquardt, I. Marquardt, I. Representative Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Representative Nash. Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson, excused. Representative Noor. Noor, I. Noor, I. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, I. Pulowski, I. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, no. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto. I. Pinto, I. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz. Schultz, I. Schultz, I. Representative Scott. No. Scott, no. Representative Sundin. Aye. Sundin, aye. Representative Hertos. Representative Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. 16 ayes and nine nays. There have been 16 ayes and nine nays. The motion prevails. House file 2128 as amended is recommended for placement on the general register and nonpartisan staff are directed to make any technical corrections. I wanna thank you, thank all of our chairs and the various health and human service committees for their hard work this session. So members, that concludes our work for the week. I wanna thank all of the partisan and the nonpartisan staff for getting us through a very, very busy and complicated schedule. We will come back at 9 a.m. on Monday to take up the tax bill and perhaps a few other bills. I want everyone to please enjoy the rest of your week. And with that, we are adjourned.